mystical theological reflections on uh, the, the biography. It's, we've got four Gospels, and it's a little like, um, suppose we had four different authors writing the history of Iowa. And we've got one in Burlington that's going to emphasize the Mississippi River era. And we've got one in Dysart that's going to write about agriculture. And we've got one in Des Moines that thinks the state government is all that really counts. And then we've got one in, let's call it Sioux City, and I'm not sure what that one would emphasize, maybe the demise of the stockyards and the weather. I don't know. So all, all four of them have a history of Iowa. Each of them has their own perspective, and we have their own terminology, and maybe include some things that are important in Burlington that they don't really pay much attention to in Sioux City or, or vice versa. But now suppose that half of what these writers have said Half of these authors have exactly the same words. Exactly, word for word. What are we going to say? Whoa, somebody copied from somebody, right? OK, that's exactly what they think happened. They think that Mark was the original gospel and that the other two used it. But there's another similarity they noticed that about a quarter of, of Matthew and a quarter of Luke are different than Mark, but the same to each other. So, again, they say, wait a minute, somebody's copping from somebody. Who is it? The scholars think that there is a lost document that both of them used, and that it was a collection of sayings not a biography, it was just, Jesus said this, Jesus said this, Jesus said this. So uh, they think that, um, oh, I, it's up on the screen there, Q. Well, the, the scholars that uh, figured this out were Germans. And so they, spoke, they thought this was the source document, Q for Quella in, in German. So scholars to this day uh, call, call it Q. Well, you can imagine that that was kind of a controversial idea for a while. What, we've got a gospel, or we've got a list of sayings of Jesus that's been lost, and we, we don't have any manuscripts of it, and it's not like the gospels that we have, just, yeah, it's impossible. Well, then in 1945, they were, uh, archaeologists were digging in Nag Hammadi in Egypt, and they found the Gospel of Thomas, and not the whole thing, but most of the manuscript called the Gospel of Thomas, which is supposed to be a gospel according to Thomas, same, same kind of series. Um, but we don't have the whole thing. And, um, but the interesting thing about the Gospel of Thomas is that it's a list of sayings. It's a list of sayings Jesus said, Jesus said, this. no biography, no context, no, the crowd thought, no, the, no, their disciples reacted, just a list of sayings, just as the scholars thought Q might be. Now, we know that the Gospel of Thomas is not Q, because the Gospel of Thomas has Jesus saying some things that nobody believes he would possibly say. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas is not in our Bible for good and sufficient reason, it's just not of the same spiritual quality. But isn't it interesting that there was a manuscript that was just a list of sayings, just as the scholars thought Q might be. So maybe someday they'll be digging around and find a copy of Q, I don't know. But at least it validates the idea that there was this source document called Q. To understand how the Bible was written, we kind of need to go back to, oh, let's say 60 to 80 AD, okay, 60 to 80 years. So um, the apostles are getting old or they're scattered around the Mediterranean doing missionary work. We don't know quite. But at least they, they don't have the apostles to ask questions about. And the people who had actually heard Jesus are dying off. So they don't have as many eyewitnesses they used to. So people are getting worried that the whole message is going to get lost and they, they need 
to write this stuff down. Well, it's a little like, um, does your family have a historian? You know, somebody that collects the stuff and you can always count on them to know the family stories? Well, probably the early church had people like that too, particularly ones that were getting worried about the eyewitnesses dying off. So they collected stuff. And that's probably partly what Luke was referring to. We don't have copies of their manuscripts, but we know that they kind of existed. We know from the letters of Paul that there were these um, communities, Christian communities around the Mediterranean, mostly seaports. And we know that you know, Paul and uh, uh, Peter and the other missionaries circulated around among these Christian communities so that they, you know, a visiting evangelist named Peter would come to town. It must have been neat. You know. uh, anyway, so we had these Christian communities and each of them would kind of remember some things. You know, do you have favorite stories in your family? Oh yeah, he always remembers that story. Tell us the story of, well that probably happened in these Christian communities so that there were diff different story, favorite stories in uh, different, um, different, uh, different communities. The main communities were Jerusalem, Rome, and then Antioch in Syria. You see where that is just uh, uh, above over near Cyprus? That's Antioch in Syria which was one of the main Christian communities of the time. So, of course, then we've got both this common tradition that everybody is talking about, and we've also got these individual stories being carried in the memory of these different communities. Uh, you know, we all have favorites, don't you? I don't know about you, but if you look at my Bible at home, you'll find that certain pa parts of the Bible are dirty. You know, I've just read those particular pages uh, more than others. Yours may be the same. Okay, so we've got a, a common, a common uh, set of teachings, but we've also got the memory being carried in individual places. So, each gospel has unique material. Each gospel has probably unique material. Each gospel, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> sorry, and the slide isn't very good. I'm sorry about that. But each gospel has unique material. So probably the way the Bible was written was uh, whoever wrote Matthew sat down, had a copy of, Matt, of Mark, had a copy of Q, and had the memories th that he'd picked up uh, and were circulating in his community, put them together, and that's what we call the Gospel of Matthew. Same thing with Luke. Luke probably had a copy of Mark, had a copy of Q, and stuff that he picked, picked up, and put that together, and that's the Gospel of Luke. By the way, the Gospel of Luke is volume one. Volume two is Acts. Luke, Acts are volume one and volume two. They are written by the uh, the same author, you can tell from the introduction to him. And whoever wrote the Luke Acts also had another very interesting document that is a tribal diary that uh, probably really does come from Luke. So in parts of the gospel, in a part of the book of Acts, it says, we went here, we did this, Paul and I did. So it's, there's an, uh, at least a fragment of an actual travel diary in, uh, worked into the book of Acts. So we have actually no manuscripts, ancient manuscripts that say the gospel according to like Matthew. We have no signed documents. And as you know, you didn't have copyright laws in those days. So authorship was not uh, defended in the courts. As a matter of fact, it was kind of traditional to take somebody else's name so I would write a book, and I would write it as a disciple of, call it Peter, so I would attach Peter's name to my book to indicate that to anybody that's reading it that I'm a disciple of Peter, and, and you can kind of count on that. Or I would claim the authority of Peter, and I might call it the, 
gospel according to Jim L. Peter or some, no, I'd have some name that would attach it to Peter because I wanted to use that authority. So authorship was entirely different in the, in the ancient world and really we don't know who wrote the, wrote the gospels. There's only one thing that we can be pretty sure of and that is none of the gospels were written by the actual apostles. Okay, now we've got, I'm putting this all together here. As a researcher, I load charts, right? So here's this pie chart summarizes what I've been saying. We have um, Mark, it's there in the purple, you see Mark, and then Mark is used by Luke and Matthew for almost half of those Gospels. And then we have Q, remember, that, that is uh, Matthew and Luke that doesn't appear in Mark, and that's on your chart down at the bottom there in blue, 23%, 25%. About 25% of, or I call it a quarter, about a quarter of each of the Gospels uh, comes from this Q, it's the same. And then each of the Gospels has something unique that's there as a part of their contribution um, to our, our understanding of the Bible. All right, where am I? So, where are we headed with all this? What's the message? What's the takeaway? For me, and the, for me, Bible study is exciting. I started with this book uh, a long time ago, and I, I love to study the Bible. And it's just a, a marvelous book. And the more we understand about the Bible, the more it challenges us. There are different ways to study the Bible. Um, you can do word studies, you can do historical studies, you could do textual studies, you can do contextual studies. There, there are even a, uh, more, some of the recent scholars are looking at canonical stu studies of why are books in the Bible or not in the Bible and why is the order the way it is. There are all kinds of ways to study the Bible. And to me, that's, that's exciting. That it's always that the Bible is speaking to me to us in different ways, but it's always challenging. So the differences among the Gospels, um, some people might call them contradictions and get all nervous about contradictions. I call them differences and I'm curious about why. Because that means they, it's the unique stamp of that Gospel writer upon the Gospel. I don't get worried about contradictions. I want to understand them. For example, Matthew is a Jewish gospel, was written, and you can, uh, you can see the explanations of Jewish customs and the Jewish festival. Jesus is even crucified on a different day in Matthew's gospel in order that is on the Passover day and that Jesus is the Paschal sacrifice. Not that way in Luke, we don't know, but the, the, the Jewish influence is important there. The differences are the writer's unique contributions. Luke, I love Luke, there are 15 parables in Luke that are only found in Luke. If we didn't have Luke, there are 15 parables that we wouldn't know about. Matthew has 10 that are unique to Matthew. Well, even John has three parables that are unique to John. The differences don't bother me, they can be kind of fun. For example, the role of, of Peter. There are places where it says, Jesus took the disciples and did such and such. Or it'll say, Jesus took Peter and the disciples and did such and such. Or uh, the Gospels one might say, Jesus asked, or the, the disciples asked Jesus a question. And one of the Gospels might say, Peter asked that same, same question. Why the differences? I don't know. Why Peter, was Peter added or was Pe Peter uh, taken away? Peter is associated uh, with the Jewish um, brand of Christianity at the time. Maybe some people wanted to emphasize that particular brand and, and maybe they wanted to de-emphasize it, I don't know. Peter is associated with Rome. So as the Roman Catholic Church was growing in power, maybe somebody added Peter to give it added power? I don't know. Is it important? Yeah, probably not. But 
to me, it's kind of fun. So Bible study to me is, is fun. The scholars are always finding out new stuff. And some people get upset with new stuff. I find the new discoveries are new insights and give new challenges to me. For example, the language of the Bible is different, or the Greek in the, in the Bible, the Greek is different than the Greek of Homer and, and Aristotle and Plato. And so there was a time that it was thought that the Bible was written in sacred Greek and it was revealed and written in the sacred Greek. Well, the archeologists got to dig around in dumps, in city dumps, and they found old uh, copies of, of bills and correspondence and just the air, and what, lo and behold, the Bible isn't written in a sacred language, it's written in the everyday language of the everyday people. It's Aristotle and Plato and the rest of them that got the outlanding Greek, so, uh, the Bible is written as what's called koine, common, common Greek, meaning that the Bible was written for ordinary people. Well, so there's a challenge in there. I have to give up the idea that the Bible was written in a sacred language and that God revealed it only in this one book. Give that up and instead I find that the Gospels, the Bible was written for ordinary people like you and like me. Give up an idea, get to what to me is a, a better one. So, the gospel is always according to, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, according to. There's always a unique point of view in each of the gospels. And each of us has a unique gospel as well. We understand the gospel in our terms in terms of our culture, our language. English does some things that uh, block us from understanding the Greek, for example. We understand uh, the Bible ourselves, each of us, understands in terms of our unique history. That is, the Bible speaks to us right where we are, in this time, in this place, and wherever you are. But it not only is the gospel according to you, it's also the gospel according to you. Other people see a gospel according to you. I had this brought home to me a number of years ago. Um, I was having a dispute with my neighbor over a fence that he had put up. And it doesn't matter whether I was right or whether I was wrong. In the course of the argument, he said, and you call yourself a Christian. It reminded me that people saw me as a Christian and that I was writing a gospel according to me. And each of you are too, a gospel according to you. Everybody in town knows if you go to church or not. Everybody in town knows which church you go to. And so there is a gospel according to you. Thinking about this old book and got me back, remembering my, back to my college days. And in the Wesley Foundation, we had a, a, pat, a worship pattern, uh, maybe some of you have encountered it, where you're in a darkened chapel and there are only candle lights at the front and somebody, a mysterious voice at the back is reading things for you to think about and uh, to be inspired by. And I got to remembering one of them. It was a poem that, you can imagine the setting, it was, the poem went something like this. Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? Amen.
Now we come to the time for joys and concerns, and if the ushers will bring the microphones further forward. What joys and concerns would you like to share? Nothing good happened this week? Well, I'll speak for Steve. <laughs> Steve's a little bashful, but he just recently retired, and we had a little get-together last night at Shell's. We had a good time. All right. <laughs> Retirement is wonderful. You get to say no. <laughs> we had a joy this week. Um, we went in for my daughter's first ultrasound and found out she's having twins. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, All right. So we have two, two new grandchildren, our first, so. <laughs> All right. Any other joys? How about concerns? Need prayers for anything special? Way in the back. Yeah, my uh, brother just went in and had a little bit of uh, surgery done. He had a, uh, a little fix-up, uh, I'm going to say a hernia fix-up that he'd had experienced some time ago. And I'd uh, pray for his recovery. Uh, he's doing quite well I would, as I talked to him, and he was very optimistic. And also my uh, grandson, who's experiencing some difficulties in his uh, relationships at home. He's uh, uh, quit his job, and he was getting ready to... Uh, get another job and some of the testing there didn't work out real well for him and he's out of a job right at the moment he's kind of working as he can to get along and I'd also like to pray for him that he can get back on track and get a job and get back to being the family man he is thank you okay there's some prayer lot other concerns um, I just wanted to have a prayer for Lorraine Homer's daughter, Arnola Stick, she had her gallbladder out last week, and she's doing well, but just prayers for healing for her. Up in the front here, Deb. Sorry, I should have written this up, but um, Alyssa, who is Ben's wife, her sister, little girl is just a year old and they found uh, cancer in a lump on her hip. But they're starting chemo, I think, yesterday. And they, they're real hopeful. There's a couple spots on her lungs too, but um, they're real hopeful, so. Oh, Angie, Angie, Gabby. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's Steve Baum's granddaughter. So a lot of you know Steve, Tom Baum, that was preacher here. It's uh, Steve Baum's granddaughter that they live in Milwaukee, so. Just say a prayer for them. We're very hopeful. They've done a lot with children's, uh, children's cancer, and he, her mother is a nurse, which helps. So she's very positive, and we're all trying to keep that way. So thanks. Anything else? Let's join in the prayers of the people. Loving God, we give thanks for all the ways you light our path and keep us in the ways of hope. Guide us in your loving ways. We hope for those who have received or experienced troubling or joyful news in these days. We pray for our own hearts that impatiently stretch ahead of us with expectations of ourselves, our community, and your holy work with us. We pray for those awaiting relief from prison and those longing for our renewed sense of your presence. We pray for all who await peace with justice in their relationships in their homeland, in all the places of your creation.
Hear us, O God, as we pray together the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O God, because we have been given so much, help us to give more. Because we are loved so much, give us strength to love more. Because we are accepted as we are, give us the grace to accept others without judgment or prejudice. We give ourselves and our gifts with grateful hearts. Let us offer our gifts, our tithes, and our offering for Christ's work here and around the world. Amen. 